during the 12th century BC, when the great powers of the Mediterranean would begin to experience what we now know as the Bronze Age Collapse, the first traces of the Holstadt culture appeared. The name derives from the town of Holstadt in northeastern Austria, nearby which excavations were made in 1846, revealing the first traces of the culture. The Holstadt culture lasted for a very long time, reaching its peak from the 8th to the 6th century BC, at which time it expanded to the south, west and north of its core. The culture would start to decline in the beginning of the 5th century BC, finally eclipsing around 440 BC, when it was succeeded by the Latin culture. It should be noted that the Holstead culture was more of a material culture rather than a tribal or an ethnic one. Over the years, the area it covered was predominantly inhabited by Celtic tribes, but there was also a minority of non-Celtic peoples. Furthermore, there were several Celtic people outside of this zone during this period, such as the Celts in Iberia, the Goloseca culture, the northwestern Gauls, and the ones inhabiting Britain and Ireland. Nevertheless, the Holstead culture is considered today as proto-Celtic, both because of the presence of Celtic tribes in the region and because of its artifacts, which represent an early form of Celtic artwork. Prior to the Holstead culture, there was another dominant culture in Central Europe, now known as Urnfield. The name is derived from the burial practice of these people, which was to burn their dead, place their ashes into urns, and then bury these urns into large fields. Inhumation was also practiced, albeit on a much smaller scale. The Urnfield culture was a material one and was divided into many distinct local groups. These groups, though, shared many characteristics, like the establishment of settlements with wooden or stone fortifications and the production of similar pottery and metalworking products. Many of these practices would continue through the beginning of the Holstead culture, but they would fade out around the 8th century BC. The Holstead culture is usually divided between four periods. We have very little information about the first two periods which comprise the so-called pre-Holstead era. During that time, the newly formed Holstead culture coexisted with the old Urnfield culture. Centuries before this period, the inhabitants of this area had already started extracting one of the two most important materials of the Holstead culture, salt. Salt was very important because of its ability to preserve food for long periods of time. Because of its value, it came to be known as white gold and would continue to be a great source of income for the Holstead people until their decline. Other profitable materials that the people of the early Holstead culture mined and exported were copper and tin, the two compounds necessary to create bronze. As for the burial rites of this period, we know that the practice of cremation coexisted with the practice of intumation. Around the end of the 8th century BC, the Holstead culture would become clearly separated from the Urnfield culture, acquiring its unique form. This is where historically the Holstead proper era begins, which is divided into the Holstead C and Holstead D periods. During the Holstead C period, iron began to be extracted and crafted in vast quantities, quickly making it the second most profitable material after salt. Iron metalworking would become an important element of the culture. The inhabitants of the Holstead zone produced weapons, tools and various artifacts from iron. Bronze metalworking would also thrive, though not as much as its iron counterpart. With the mass exporting of salt, iron, copper and tin, the Holstead culture began to flourish economically. The benefit of being situated near many of Europe's largest rivers made it easier for the Holstead people to control the trade in Central Europe. They also connected the people of Northern Europe with the people of the Mediterranean through a lucrative trading system. During that time, the Holstead culture spread to other areas of Central and Western Europe. The reasons for this expansion are not clear, but historians suggest that it was due to the established trade network, the intermarriages between neighboring people, the alliances between various tribes and the migrations of people as new settlements needed to be established. The accumulation of wealth brought changes into the societies of the Holstead zone. They became much more hierarchical, with an aristocratic elite forming the highest rank of the society. During the Holstead Tea period, the culture would reach its peak, 
The trade was expanded even further, especially to the Mediterranean shores, which along with new technologies in metalworking and mining made the Hallstatt culture collect more wealth. This resulted to an even greater expansion of the culture across Europe, while also heavily influencing their neighbours. Along with the accumulation of wealth came the concentration of power to much fewer settlements and people who eventually held more authority. Ultimately, after many major changes that took place both within and outside the Hallstatt zone, the culture eclipsed during the mid-5th century BC, giving way to the rise of the Latin culture. Salt mining has a very old history in the region of Hallstatt. Roughly 7,000 years ago, the inhabitants of this region started extracting salt from natural briny springs using the method of evaporation, while they also extracted it from caves using tools like deer antlers and stone axes. Thousands of years later, around the beginning of the Bronze Age in the 15th century BC, the first salt mines were constructed. These included three mine shafts which were over 100 meters deep. There, the miners would use pickaxes to strike the salt veins and would gather the salt and deposit it into large sacks. The sacks would be carried to the first floor of the mine and hoisted to the surface inside containers which were secured with ropes. The excavations that were done in the Bronze Age mines revealed many interesting finds, including a 3300-year-old detachable and modular wooden staircase and salt bags with adjustable straps which could hold up to 30 kilograms of salt and were equipped with a wooden mechanism that quickly emptied the bag. These mines would eventually be abandoned due to natural disasters. Around the beginning of the Iron Age, several new mines were constructed. This time though, the mine construction along with the mining techniques were much more developed. The mines were built in a complex way. They followed the paths of the salt veins and were much bigger in length and width, while each floor had much more open space which allowed better ventilation and lighting. Evidence of cooking has been found, with many archaeologists suggesting that the miners spent most of their day inside the mine along with their families. Furthermore, a new mining method was used, which allowed large tablets of salt to be extracted. These new technologies made it easier for the people of Hallstatt to acquire vast amounts of salt in less time, making them much wealthier. Similar mines, although less in number, were constructed nearby the region of modern Salzburg in Austria. As we mentioned, salt was highly sought after, especially in Central Europe, where it was very scarce, making it arguably the most valuable commodity of the inhabitants of the Hallstatt zone. A few decades after the decline of the Hallstatt culture, these mines would eventually collapse due to natural disasters. According to archaeological findings, the inhabitants of the Hallstatt culture were excellent crafters of bronze and later iron, creating unique weapons and tools. They were one of the first people in Europe who piled up large quantities of iron thanks to their advanced techniques of mining and smelting the ore. The abundance of iron made way for the mass production of agricultural tools, which gave them a distinct advantage over their neighbouring societies. Their great metalworking skills, though, are evident through the weapon craftsmanship. The weaponry of the Hallstatt culture was comprised mostly of swords, of which mainly two types were found. The Mindelheim and the Gundlingen, named after the region that the oldest sword of each type was found. The Mindelheim swords were mostly made of iron, with bronze being the less frequent second choice. These swords were very long, especially for their time, with an average length of 85 centimeters or 34 inches. According to modern historians, these swords were best suited for cavalry warfare. Mindelheim swords are mostly found in Central Europe, around the core of the Hallstatt culture. The Gindlingen swords were usually made of bronze rather than iron. The length of these swords was smaller than their Mindelheim counterparts, and most of the time the hilts were smaller too. These swords were probably not used by horse riders, but by infantry. Gindlingen swords were found both in Central and Western Europe, with their numbers far exceeding their Mindelheim counterparts. The conclusion from this is that the Mindelheim type was mostly used by people of a high social status compared to the Gundlingen swords which were probably used by the average warrior. 
It should be noted that these swords were very similar to the ones used by the Celts of later centuries. Towards the end of the last Hallstatt period, the people focused more on producing spears and daggers, some of which were richly ornamented. The widespread manufacture and use of iron swords would return with the rise of the Latin culture. The people of the Hallstatt culture were involved in trading activities from the very beginning. They initially traded salt, bronze and tin with their neighbouring people. During the later periods, iron metalworking, especially weapons, would comprise a large part of their exports. All of these materials were highly sought after by the people of the surrounding areas, allowing the Hallstatt culture to thrive and expand slowly but steadily throughout Central and Western Europe. In the early period, they had the advantage of immediate access to the Danube, which helped them establish trading networks with the East. However, the trade would really flourish during the Hallstatt C and D periods, when the culture greatly expanded towards all directions. During this time, they had access to many of the large rivers of Europe, including the Rhone, the Danube and the Rhine. It was also the time where the Greek city of Massalia was established in southern Gaul. The Massalians had instant access to the Rhone and developed trade ties with the Hallstatt people, transporting items from all around the Mediterranean. The people of the Hallstatt culture also began establishing trade ties with the Goloseca culture to the south and later with the expanding Etruscans. The Hallstatt culture was also the intermediate between Scandinavia and the Baltics on one hand and the Mediterranean Sea on the other, which, as we mentioned, gave them a very crucial role in the trading network of Europe. Thousands of exotic items were found all around the Hallstatt region, including many Greek and Etruscan wine vases, amber beads from the Baltic and even silk from Central and East Asia. The contact of the Hallstatt culture with its trading partners enriched their way of life, with the aristocratic class adopting many foreign elements in architecture and cultural practices. Additionally, because of the trade network, many items of Hallstatt origin were found all over Europe. As we previously mentioned, during the Hallstatt proper era, a hierarchy was formed in which a class of aristocratic warriors or chieftains held the highest position. Among the most interesting archaeological findings are the various aristocratic tombs that were excavated. The many different items found in those tombs give us a great insight of their wealth. Many four-wheeled vehicles were excavated, mostly made of iron, along with horse gear. These, along with the long swords that were found in the graves, indicate that the aristocratic class was mainly comprised of mounted warriors. It is believed that the Hallstatt elite adopted this style from the Cimmerian people when they established themselves on the Great Hungarian Plain. The adoption and use of the new Cimmerian horse breed by the aristocrats made the horse a symbol of power among the Hallstatt people. Another common finding in these tombs is the large quantity of foreign goods. In order to be clearly distinguished from the common people, the aristocrats adopted some foreign practices in which these items were used. One of these practices was the symposium, which is evident from the amount of the excavated kilixes and wine-mixing craters. Apart from the foreign items, these tombs also contained many objects of local production, among which were bracelets, rings and vases. Among the most elaborate of these tombs is the Hochdorf chieftain's grave located in South Germany. The tomb was comprised of a mound, inside of which was an 11 square meter crypt chamber. Buried inside was a 40-year-old male who was probably the chieftain of a nearby settlement. His height, which was 1.80 meters, was exceptional for their time. He was laid on a bronze couch which was decorated with depictions of warfare and dances. The couch was held by eight female figurines. The chieftain's clothing was extremely elaborate for their time. It was comprised of a gold-plated talk necklace, a golden bracelet and shoes with golden ornaments. He also wore two golden brooches and a gold plate on the front of his belt. The rest of his clothing had already disintegrated when the tomb was found. One of the most intricate items found in the tomb was the gold-plated dagger that was placed upon the body. Additional items that were found on the bronze couch were a cone-shaped hat made of birch bark, amber jewellery, arrows, fishing hooks, a nail clipper and a wooden comb. 
Near the feet of the bronze couch was a large cauldron of Greek origin, decorated with lions at the top, which was originally filled with honey meat. Around the chamber, nine large drinking horns were hanged, with the largest one being richly ornamented. Opposite the man was a large four-wheeled vehicle made of wood, iron and bronze with nine balls placed upon it. Another famous aristocratic tomb is the grave of the Lady of Vix found in northern Burgundy in France. The tomb was comprised of a 16 square meter wooden chamber located underneath a 5 meter high tumulus. Inside the chamber, a young woman of aristocratic descent was buried. She was laid on a vehicle made of bronze, iron and wood of which the four wheels had been removed and placed alongside the wagon. This woman was adorned with rich jewellery which consisted of a 24 carat golden torque adorned with winged horses, a large bronze torque, six fibulae, several golden plated bracelets and one amber bracelet. Near the wagon, a massive bronze cauldron was placed, known today as the Vix Crater. The crater of 1.64 meters height is of Greek origin and was used as a vessel to mix wine with water for the symposiums. As you can see, it was lavishly adorned with figures of soldiers, animals and mythological beings. On the top was the figurine of a woman which some suggest that depicts the Lady of Vix. The crater remains the largest metal vessel of the ancient world ever discovered. Inside the chamber, metal and ceramic wine vessels were found, both of Greek and Etruscan origin. After the excavation of the grave, a large fortified settlement was found nearby. The tomb of the Lady of Fix may be an indication that aristocratic women may have held great power and authority in the late Hallstatt era. The art of the Hallstatt culture is very unique and is regarded as a form of proto-Celtic art. One of its characteristics is that the kitchenware pottery, including dishes, jars and drinking vessels, was adorned with geometric motifs. Jewellery was very distinctive as well. It comprised of artworks such as golden torques, like the ones in the Vix and the Ochdorf tombs, amber necklaces and bracelets, and various rings made from gold, iron and bronze. As we said, the sword craftsmanship of the Holstadt blacksmiths was very advanced, making these weapons famous even outside of the Holstadt zone. The daggers that were crafted in the late Holstadt era are also intricately made and were considered a symbol of power. Both the daggers and the swords were often lavishly decorated with ivory hilts, gold plating and elaborate sheaths. Axes made of bronze or iron were also found, as well as a few armour breastplates. There were thousands of non-warfare metalworking items as well. Many animal figurines were found, depicting mainly ducks, swans and bulls. Human figurines were also found, although they were less in number. The most notable artwork that contained human figurines is the Stritzweg chariot found inside an aristocratic tomb. In its centre stands a very tall woman holding a ball above her head and she is surrounded by men and animals. Some archaeologists suggest that this is a depiction of a sacrifice or a libation, while others say that it depicts a hunt. Another very unique work of the Holstadt culture were the intricately decorated belts. These were ornamented either with distinctive geometrical motifs or depicting various scenes of life such as fights between warriors and drinking parties. Among the most interesting of the Holstadt findings were the golden hats. Four objects of this type have been found in different places dating from different periods. The oldest one was made during the late Urnfield period, while the other three were made during the early Hallstatt period between 1000 and 800 BC. These hats were of tall conical shape and were made of a very thin sheet of gold, which was probably added over a layer of leather or cloth. Judging by their ornamentation, modern scholars suggest that the symbols on the hat depicted a solar and lunar calendar. Last but not least, the four-wheeled wagons found inside aristocratic tombs were a distinct characteristic of the chieftain class. The wagons were meticulously made with various metalworking additions. 
It should be noted that the artwork had a slightly different character depending on the region. The late Hallstatt culture gave rise to the distinct geometric motifs and animalistic depictions that were characterized as proto-Celtic and would later evolve into the Celtic proper art of the Latin culture. Aside from the local artifacts, many foreign ones were also found, mainly of Etruscan and Greek origin. These included pottery and metalwork of Massalia and Attica, Etruscan wine vessels and various kitchenware, drinking horns from the eastern plains, and silk from Central Asia. The people of the Hallstatt culture usually inhabited fortified settlements built upon hills where a class of aristocrats held the authority and ruled over the surrounding area. The settlements were comprised of narrow streets lined with houses made of timber or stone. These hill forts usually had their own blacksmith forges and metal workshops. There were usually minor settlements around the forts inhabited by many farmers. When an enemy would raid the area, these people would fortify themselves inside the citadel. It seems that there were small-scale conflicts among the people of the Holstead culture, as is indicated by the violent destruction of some of these fortifications. Apart from the safety of the settlement, the hill forts were built as a way for the chieftains to demonstrate their power. At least 16 hill forts have been excavated around a large zone from northeastern France to the western part of the Czech Republic. Two of the biggest and most famous were the Mont Lassois and the Heunigberg Forts. The Mont Lassois Hill Fort was found nearby the grave of the Lady of Vix. The settlement was built around the 7th century BC and reached its peak during the 6th and 5th centuries BC. It seems that it was a trade center as thousands of different objects were found, both of foreign and local origin. The fortifications around the settlement were very strong and were made in such a way so that the inhabitants would have safe access to the Seine River. Upon the top of the hill, there was a number of great buildings, the largest of which was very impressive and quite unique in Northern Europe. Known today as the Palace of the Lady of Vix, this building was exceptionally large for the time, reaching a height of 12 meters. Archaeologists have discovered painted wall plaster inside, an indication that the building had decorated walls. The findings inside included many wine vessels such as those found in aristocratic tombs, as well as a large hearth in the center, suggesting that it was a place reserved for great gatherings and feasts. Below the great building complex was the lower town, which was also inside the walls. No traces of buildings have been found outside of these walls. The presence of the tomb of the Lady of Vix and two more smaller in scale tombs of aristocratic women may suggest, as we mentioned, that the settlement and its surroundings were ruled by noble women. The most important hill fort of the Hallstatt era was the Heunigberg settlement in southeastern Germany. Located upon a 40 meter high hill, it overlooked the Danube River. Luckily, some parts of it have been rebuilt today, making it easier for us to comprehend the structure of the settlement. An imposing mud brick wall built upon a stone foundation surrounded the citadel, equipped with rectangular towers along its northern and western parts. Additionally, ditches were dug outside the wall for extra protection. The construction was probably influenced by contemporary Mediterranean architecture. Inside these walls were buildings of moderate stature made from wood and stone. It is estimated that during its peak, the citadel had around 5,000 inhabitants. There was a lower city that was located westward of the citadel, where the hill was terraced and houses similar to those in the citadel were found. A second wall made of wood surrounded both the lower city and the citadel. Around the wall was a deep V-shaped ditch. The entrance to the second wall was a relatively large building constructed with the same materials as the citadel wall and equipped with one outer and one inner gate. In front of it was a bridge that was built upon the ditch. The extensive fortifications of the citadel and the lower city were very unique to the area and were surprisingly similar to the archaic Greek settlements. They indicate that the Heuningberg settlement was at a very important location and had accumulated so much wealth that its people had to build strong extensive fortifications to protect it. 
Outside of the second wall was a huge area of closely spaced farmsteads in which people cultivated the land and kept livestock animals. The farmsteads were enclosed by rectangular palisades and large timber fortifications divided the area around the hill fort into many different quarters. The various findings around the settlement are also proof that it was a very strong political and economic center. Black figure attic pottery, wine and foray from Massalia, amber beads from the Baltics, Etruscan vessels and Asian silk were all found inside the settlement, indicating trade connections with faraway lands. Northwest of the citadel, a number of aristocratic tombs were found, such as the Hochmihele Mound, which included the characteristic four-wheeled wagon. These were probably the tombs of the chieftains that ruled the Heuningberg settlement. Aside from the hill forts, there were smaller settlements as well inside the Holstad zone. Some were built at key river locations in order to control the trade, while others were built high upon the mountains and evolved into mining towns. The decline of the Holstead culture began around 480 BC and by 440 BC the culture had collapsed and was succeeded by the Laten culture. This transition was more of a change of the culture's core location and of the artwork patterns rather than the removal of an old people and the establishment of a new one. The hill forts of Holstead were completely abandoned with the exception of the Hohenasberg settlement in South Germany. A new class of warrior elites would rise, building new hill forts that occupied a region from northern France to Bohemia, which comprised the initial core of the Laten culture. The hill forts were situated around the rivers Loire, Marne, Moselle, and Elbe. The tombs of the Laten aristocrats contained a large variety of weapons, which indicates that the Laten culture was more warlike than the Holstadt one. Hundreds of swords, spearheads and shields were found. The Laten elites were buried with vehicles, but these had two wheels instead of their four-wheeled counterparts. The two-wheeled vehicles were probably an Etruscan influence. Regarding the artwork, the Laten craftsmen developed even more advanced techniques, producing exquisite objects from gold and iron. The Holstadt artwork of geometric designs and animal or human figurines would continue. However, new art styles would also appear, such as vegetal designs, new depictions of mythological beasts and other styles which were a combination of Etruscan and Greek art with local Celtic elements. The answer to the question of why the Holstadt core collapsed is not clear. Some scholars suggest that the Mediterranean cultures found other centers of trade, mainly in Iberia, and partially lost interest in the trade of Central Europe. Others say that the people of the Mediterranean found ways to trade with the cultures of Northern and Western Europe without the Holstead core acting as an intermediary. This would ultimately deal a massive blow to the Holstead elites, as during the late period they were largely dependent on the trade of Mediterranean luxury items. Another theory suggests that the people living on the northern periphery of the Holstadt core, who provided the latter with many important products and raw materials, began a series of attacks against the Holstadt core area, seeking to obtain the luxurious items of the elites. The fact that warfare and raids were characteristics of the Latin culture would suggest that the people on the periphery were indeed warlike societies.